Suppose you should be walking down Broadway after dinner, with ten minutes allotted to the consummation of your cigar, while you are choosing between a diverting tragedy and something serious in the way of vaudeville. Suddenly, a hand is laid upon your arm. You turn to look into the thrilling eyes of a beautiful woman, wonderful in diamonds and Russian sables. She thrusts hurriedly into your hand an extremely hot buttered roll, flashes out a tiny pair of scissors, snips off the second button of your overcoat, meaningly ejaculates the one word, parallelogram, and swiftly flies down a cross street, looking back fearfully over her shoulder. That would be pure adventure. Would you accept it? Not you. You would flush with embarrassment. You would sheepishly drop the roll and continue down Broadway, fumbling feebly for the missing button. This you would do, unless you are one of the blessed few in whom the pure spirit of adventure is not dead. True adventurers have never been plentiful. They who are set down in print as such have been mostly businessmen with newly invented methods. They have been out after the things they wanted, Golden fleeces, holy grails, lady loves, treasure, crowns, and fame. The true adventurer goes forth aimless and uncalculating to meet and greet unknown fate. A fine example was the prodigal son when he started back home. Half adventurers, brave and splendid figures, have been numerous. From the Crusades to the Palisades, they have enriched the arts of history and fiction in the trade of historical fiction. But each of them had a prize to win, a goal to kick, an axe to grind, a race to run, a new thrust and tears to deliver, a name to carve, a crow to pick. So they were not followers of true adventure. In the big city, the twin spirits romance and adventure are always abroad seeking worthy wooers. As we roam the streets, they slyly peep at us and challenge us in twenty different guises. Without knowing why, we look up suddenly to see in a window a face that seems to belong to our gallery of intimate portraits. In a sleeping thoroughfare, we hear a cry of agony and a fear coming from an empty and shuttered house. Instead of at our familiar curb, a cab driver deposits us before a strange door, which one, with a smile, opens for us and bids us enter. A slip of paper, written upon, flutters down to our feet from the high lattices of chance. We exchange glances of instantaneous hate, affection and fear with hurrying strangers in the passing crowds. A sudden douse of rain in our umbrella may be sheltering the daughter of the full moon and the cousin of the sidereal system. At every corner, handkerchiefs drop, fingers beckon, eyes besiege, and the lost, the lonely, the rapturous, the mysterious, the perilous changing clues of adventure are slipped into our fingers. But few of us are willing to hold and follow them. We are grown stiff with the ramrod of convention down our backs. We pass on, and some day we come, at the end of our very dull life, to reflect that our romance has been a pallid thing of a marriage or two, a satin rosette kept in a safe deposit drawer, and a lifelong feud with a steam radiator. Rudolf Steiner was a true adventurer. Few were the evenings on which he did not go forth from his hall bedchamber in search of the unexpected and the egregious. The most interesting thing in life seemed to him to be what might lie just around the next corner. Sometimes his willingness to tempt fate led him into strange paths. Twice he had spent the night in a station house, Again and again he had found himself the dupe of ingenious and mercenary tricksters. His watch and money had been the price of one flattering allurement. But with undiminished ardor, he picked up every glove cast before him into the merry lists of adventure. One evening, Rudolph was strolling along a cross-town street in the older central part of the city. Two streams of people filled the sidewalks the home hurrying, and that restless contingent that abandons home for the specious welcome of the thousand candle power table d'hote. The young adventurer was of pleasing presence and moved serenely and watchfully. By daylight he was a salesman in a piano store. 
He wore his tie drawn through a topaz ring instead of fastened with a stick pin. And once he had written to the editor of a magazine that Junie's Love Test by Miss Libby had been the book that had most influenced his life. During his walk, a violent chattering of teeth in a glass case on the sidewalk seemed at first to draw his attention, with a qualm, to a restaurant before which it was set, but a second glance revealed the electric letters of a dentist sign high above the next door. A giant negro, fantastically dressed in a red embroidered coat, yellow trousers, and a military cap, discreetly distributed cards to those of the passing crowd who consented to take them. This mode of dentistic advertising was a common sight to Rudolph. Usually he passed the dispenser of the dentist's cards without reducing his store, but tonight the African slipped one into his hand so deftly that he retained it there, smiling a little at the successful feat. When he had traveled a few yards further, he glanced at the card indifferently. Surprised, he turned it over and looked again with interest. One side of the card was blank. On the other was written in ink three words. The Green Door. And then Rudolph saw, three steps in front of him, a man throw down the card the Negro had given him as he passed. Rudolph picked it up. It was printed with the dentist's name and address and the usual schedule of plate work and bridge work and specious promises of painless operations. The adventurous piano salesman halted at the corner and considered. Then he crossed the street, walked down a block, recrossed, and joined the upward current of people again. Without seeming to notice the negro as he passed the second time, he carelessly took the card that was handed him. Ten steps away, he inspected it. In the same handwriting that appeared on the first card, the green door was inscribed upon it. Three or four cards were tossed on the pavement by pedestrians, both following and leading him. These fell blank side up. Rudolph turned them over. Every one bore the printed legend of the dental parlors. Rarely did the arch sprite adventure need to beckon twice to Rudolph Steiner, his true follower. But twice it had been done, and the quest was on. Rudolph walked slowly back to where the giant negro stood by the case of rattling teeth. This time as he passed, he received no card. In spite of his gaudy and ridiculous garb, the Ethiopian displayed a natural barbaric dignity as he stood, offering the cards suavely to some, allowing others to pass unmolested. Every half minute, he chanted a harsh, unintelligible phrase akin to the jabber of car conductors and grand opera. And not only did he withhold a card this time, but it seemed to Rudolph that he received from the shining and massive black countenance a look of cold, almost contemptuous disdain. The look stung the adventurer. He read in it a silent accusation that he had been found wanting. Whatever the mysterious written words in the cards might mean, the black had selected him twice from the throng for their recipient, and now seemed to have condemned him as deficient in the wit and spirit to engage the enigma. Standing aside from the rush, the young man made a rapid estimate of the building in which he conceived that his adventure must lie. Five stories high it rose, a small restaurant occupied the basement. The first floor, now closed, seemed to house millinery or furs. The second floor, by the winking electric letters, was the dentist's. Above this, a polyglot babel of signs struggled to indicate the abodes of palmists, dressmakers, musicians, and doctors. Still higher up, draped curtains and milk bottles wide on the window sills proclaimed the regions of domesticity. After concluding his survey, Rudolph walked briskly up the high flight of stone steps into the house. Up two flights of the carpeted stairway he continued, and at its top paused. The hallway there was dimly lighted by two pale jets of gas. One far to his right, the other nearer to his left. He looked toward the near light and saw, within its wan halo, a green door. For one moment he hesitated. Then he seemed to see the contumelious sneer of the African juggler of cards. And then he walked straight to the green door and knocked against it. Moments like those that passed before his knock was answered measure the quick breath of true adventure. What might not be behind those green panels? Gamesters at play, cunning rogues baiting their traps with subtle skill, beauty and love with courage, and thus planning to be sought by it, danger, death, love, disappointment, ridicule, any of these might respond to that temerarious rap. 
A faint rustle was heard inside, and the door slowly opened. A girl not yet twenty stood there, white-faced and tottering. She loosed the knob and swayed weakly, groping with one hand. Rudolph caught her and laid her on a faded couch that stood against the wall. He closed the door and took a swift glance around the room by the light of a flickering gas jet. Neat, but extreme poverty was the story that he read. The girl lay still, as if in a faint. Rudolph looked around the room excitedly for a barrel. People must be rolled upon a barrel who... Wait, no, no, that was for drowned persons. He began to fan her with his hat. That was successful, for he struck her nose with the brim of his derby, and she opened her eyes. And then the young man saw that hers, indeed, was the one missing face from his heart's gallery of intimate portraits. The frank, gray eyes, the little nose turning pertly outward, the chestnut hair curling like the tendrils of a pea vine, seemed the right end and reward of all his wonderful adventures. But the face was woefully thin and pale. The girl looked at him calmly and then smiled. Fainted, didn't I? she asked weakly. Well, who wouldn't? You try going without anything to eat for three days and see. Himmel! exclaimed Rudolph, jumping up. Wait till I come back. He dashed out the green door and down the stairs. In twenty minutes he was back again, kicking at the door with his toe for her to open it. With both arms he hugged an array of wares from the grocery and the restaurant. On the table he laid them, bread and butter, cold meats, cakes, pies, pickles, oysters, a roasted chicken, a bottle of milk, and one of red-hot tea. This is ridiculous, said Rudolph, blusteringly, to go without eating. You must quit making election bets of this kind. Supper is ready. He helped her to a chair at the table and asked, Is there a cup for tea? On a shelf by the window, she answered. When he turned again with the cup, he saw her, with eyes shining rapturously, beginning upon a huge dill pickle that she had rooted out from the paper bags with a woman's unerring instinct. He took it from her, laughingly, and poured the cup full of milk. Drink that first, he ordered, and then you shall have some tea, and then a chicken wing. If you are very good, you shall have a pickle tomorrow. And now, if you'll allow me to be your guest, we'll have supper. He drew up the other chair. The tea brightened the girl's eyes and brought back some of her color. She began to eat with a sort of dainty ferocity, like some starved wild animal. She seemed to regard the young man's presence and the aid he had rendered her as a natural thing, not as though she undervalued the conventions, but as one whose great stress gave her the right to put aside the artificial for the human. But gradually, with the return of strength and comfort, came also a sense of the little conventions that belong and she began to tell him her little story. It was one of a thousand such as the city yawns at every day. The shop girl's story of insufficient wages, further reduced by fines that go to swell the store's profits, of time lost through illness, and then of lost physicians, lost hope, and the knock of the adventurer upon the green door. But to Rudolph the history sounded as big as the Iliad or the crisis in Junie's love test. To think of you going through all that, he exclaimed. It was something fierce, said the girl solemnly. And you have no relatives or friends in the city? None whatever. I am all alone in the world, too, said Rudolph after a pause. I am glad of that, said the girl promptly, and somehow it pleased the young man to hear that she approved of his bereft condition. Very suddenly... Her eyelids dropped, and she sighed deeply. I'm awfully sleepy, she said, and I feel so good. Then Rudolph rose and took his hat. I'll say good night. A long night's sleep will be fine for you. He held out his hand, and she took it and said good night. But her eyes asked a question so eloquently, so frankly, and pathetically that he answered it with words. Oh, I'm coming back tomorrow to see how you are getting along. You can't get rid of me so easily. Then, at the door, as though the way of his coming had been so much less important than the fact that he had come, she asked, How did you come to knock at my door? He looked at her for a moment, remembering the cards, and felt a sudden jealous pain. What if they had fallen into other hands as adventurous as his? Quickly he decided that she must never know the truth. He would never let her know that he was aware of the strange expedient to which she had been driven by her great distress. One of our piano tuners lives in this house, he said. I knocked at your door by mistake. 
The last thing he saw in the room before the green door closed was her smile. At the head of the stairway, he paused and looked curiously about him, and then he went along the hallway to its other end, and, coming back, ascended to the floor above and continued his puzzled explorations. Every door that he found in the house was painted green. Wondering, he descended to the sidewalk. The fantastic African was still there. Rudolph confronted him with his two cards in his hand. Will you tell me why you gave me these cards and what they mean? he asked. In a broad, good-natured grin, the Negro exhibited a splendid advertisement of his master's profession. There it is, boss, he said, pointing down the street. But I expect he was a little late for the first act. Looking the way he pointed, Rudolph saw above the entrance to a theater the blazing electric sign of its new play, The Green Door. I'm informed that it's a first-rate show, sir, said the Negro. The agent what represents it presented me with a dollar, sir to distribute a few of his cards along with the doctor's. May I offer you one of the doctor's cards, sir? At the corner of the block in which he lived, Rudolph stopped for a glass of beer and a cigar. When he had come out with his lighted weed, he buttoned his coat, pushed back his hat, and said stoutly to the lamppost on the corner, All the same, I believe it was the hand of fate that doped out the way for me to find her. Which conclusion, under the circumstances certainly admits Rudolf Steiner to the ranks of the true followers of romance and adventure. <laughs>